courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's been a busy week for the Flames, and once again, I'm Dan alongside my co-host Matt, and we're back to talk Flames hockey. Matt, how are you feeling this week? I know you were you went on kind of a tangent last week about the coach. You feeling any better? Well, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes you just get frustrated because the team should be better than what we saw previous to this week and you know sometimes you just need to get out and say what you know uh, what's on your mind and that was last week the you got it all out of your system you're good now yeah well it's one of those things where it, i think everybody was a little frustrated with the team uh, i think the players were frustrated uh just based off of uh, seeing how they responded and the coaching staff obviously was a little frustrated with the team with the bag skate after uh the game prior to our show so yeah it, they obviously had a good week they took five or six points and okay go out do it again that's uh, you know, uh, uh, you can only just play it by ear, and if th- they start sliding back into where it's been, then more complaints will be aired. <laughs> and if they turn it around and start playing as they should be, then everything's good. Well, let's talk about what's happened since we talked last. We talked last uh, last Tuesday, right after the Philly game. And the Flames have played three games since then. They went on a road swing of Eastern Canada. And start with the game against the Maple Leafs in Toronto. In my opinion, the Flames shouldn't have lost this one. They played a good game. They had no business losing. But as we've seen a few times this season, I think they just ran into a hot goalie. I think Frederick Anderson looked good in this game. And that's what kept the Flames from getting the two. Yep. And uh, you can only do so much. And sometimes a goaltender can steal a game, and that was the case in this one. Uh, Calgary was the better team throughout. I think they were better than Toronto the, the last meeting between the two teams. It just things got away from them rather quickly in that one. And uh, they, they did fall in the shootout, but the shootout is a crapshoot most of the time so it's it is what it is it, you can't really complain too much you got a point it, two would have been better but it was a good statement game of getting back on the horse after the week prior we lost the season series to nothing to toronto but at the same time as much as it stings it's an eastern conference team in the long run, it doesn't really mean much. It's too, it's, you know, we got a point out of it, and it's not like we gave up a point, someone right behind us in the standings. Exactly. Like, if you're going to lose to an Eastern Conference team, it's like, eh, who cares? Like, it's not like you're losing to Vegas or San Jose or LA or something where it's actually important to get the two points. And the next night, Calgary played again on the road. David Riddick got his second ever NHL start as the Flames took on the Montreal Canadiens. Again went to extra time, but this time it was a different result for the Flames as they won 3-2 to two in overtime. Well, it's pretty cool for David Riddick. Uh, he idolized Patrick Waugh growing up, and his first two NHL wins come against the Colorado Avalanche and the Montreal Canadiens. So, how fitting. Not just against those teams, but in their barns. True. So, it was a good effort by Riddick. I think that he should be playing more often than he has been. And that was part of our rant, (laughs) my rant last week. But uh, he is showing to be a capable NHL goaltender. And the only way to see what his ceiling is, is for him to get more action and it's a mutual benefit because Smith can't play 65, 70 games and expect to be a top-notch performer in the playoffs. So it's a little bit of a win-win if Riddick can spell Smith at times and throw up good performances. In his first game, the Colorado game, I thought that Riddick, I mean, he made some mistakes in that game that you say, yeah, these are rookie mistakes. If I didn't know any better... And I talked to someone who was a Montreal fan who didn't know that Riddick was a new call-up. 
if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't have known that he was brand new to the NHL in that Montreal game. He looked, I mean, he didn't look like a starter, but he looked like a season backup. Oh, for sure. And he acquitted himself rather well. And there's no reason why he shouldn't get more action. It's one of those situations where if the player is playing well, you have to let him play himself out of a job. And he he's done well in the two starts and even the period last year you have to see what you have in him as a player uh, whether you know you make him the backup next year or perhaps Gillies instead so the more action he gets the more information you have to make roster decisions moving forward well, that's part of the reason why he's still here, right? I mean, they've kept him in Calgary because they want to see more of him. Um, I thought in this game it was kind of an interesting game for the Flames, looking at it overall. I thought in the first period the Flames came out better than Montreal did. I thought they had better pressure. I think the Canadians really came and put some pressure on in the second. And I wouldn't say they had the Flames on the ropes, but I would say Montreal definitely was playing the better game in the second. And the Flames, I think powered back in about the last eight minutes of the third period there took control of the game again which is important to see they can do that when they're being outworked or someone else has the advantage that can you come back in those dying minutes get it under control and then end up getting the win well it's interesting that you have a player in Garnett Hathaway who's come up with little fanfare and he played a bunch of games last year only had the one goal but he's the type of player that is a relentless ball of energy and he's very smart and knows where he needs to go in the offensive zone like he's not a dynamic offensive talent but he's just goes to the right places and when I watched him in Stockton previously that was how he generated most of his offense down there was just being in the right place at the right time and we saw that in that game with the equalizer in the third period, just a relentless play by both him and uh, Sam Bennett crashing the net and the puck goes in. And good on Glenn Gullitson for challenging that play because the referees were not going to go with it, but Toronto did, so it was all good. And that kind of secondary efforts and drive especially late in games will help Calgary to not cough up points needlessly yeah no it was uh it was that was a fun thing to see and I think you know you're mentioning Hathaway I had the chance to talk with the coach in the media scrum after the Vancouver game which we'll talk about in a minute here but you can tell the coach really likes Hathaway and you know he, he told Garnett that um, they only they only had so many roster spots at the beginning of the season. That's why they send them down and to keep working hard. And the coach thinks that he rose to the occasion and was able to uh, you know to earn his way back up. And we see Garnet Hathaway even with a regular number this year, not wearing sixty four. We'll talk more about him later in the show. But I think that Garnet Hathaway is really proving that he can be that bottom six guy right now. And he he looked great in the Vancouver game too. And why don't we jump to that game, Matt? The Flames came back. Uh, they pl- they came back to their barn. I wasn't really sure what to expect after a two-game road trip where the Flames looked good at some points and not others. I said going into this game, if the Flames wanted to win, they had to play like a road game. And I'll admit, this was a pretty boring game, the way both teams were playing um, in the game. But it was nice to see, as we saw in, in Montreal, the Flames sort of powered back in the last... Five, eight minutes, took this one, and ended up winning 4-2 to two to Vancouver. Calgary gave up the early goal to Jake Bertanen. And and then Troy Brower, of all people, made it up. Troy Brower is starting to play more like Troy Brower. And the, the early part of the season, he was kind of struggling to figure out what he needed to do in order to be successful in the role that he was in. And he's starting to come around and it's one of those things that where if you have a player who's used to putting up a certain number of points and they struggle like Sam Bennett was at the beginning of the season sometimes you just need a good bounce to go your way and then you start playing a lot better and Brower had one of those goals the other day and 
it, where it was just a bit of a bad rebound given up by the goaltender, and he whacked the puck in. And now he's starting to look more like the player that Troy Brower has been. And it hopefully he can continue to play that way because of the fact that it's good for him and the team if he's playing like himself. Another guy who's playing really well, and we saw in this game, Sam Bennett looked all looked good this whole game. He ended up getting on the score sheet as fourth of the year. And I think one of the more impressive things, we mentioned Hathaway earlier, Hathaway, after assisting that goal, now has, I believe, three points in seven games, or four points in seven games in the NHL level now. So that's pretty impressive for a third-line guy. Well, that's the thing. Sam Bennett, uh, he obviously struggled in the first 15 games didn't get a point in a lot of penalty minutes but at, since then he's been playing more like himself and I think the chemistry between him and Jankowski has really developed into something good and it's interesting both Yager and Hathaway being all, the third guy on that line each one has complemented that line very effectively, and even though the two players play significantly different styles of game. So it'll be interesting. It does afford some flexibility moving forward if Hathaway can continue to play well, that perhaps you can utilize Yager in a different spot. And I think the fact that we have some uh, chemistry there, because we know that Jankowski and Hathaway are playing together in Stockton, I think that really helps as well. You know, that's that they bring that chemistry there. And I think for a good part of the beginning of the season, that's what the Flames have been trying to build is chemistry among. I mean, we know the 3M line has it. We know Johnny and Monty have it. But I think everyone else are trying to build that chemistry. And so when you can get two guys, we know this coach likes his pairs, and you can put a pair together, you're immediately going to get that benefit. Yeah, well, exactly. And Jankowski and Hathaway have been line mates in Stockton since Jankowski turned pro. So it's a natural fit that's how who he's played with and they obviously are working well together so if that can work then perhaps you can utilize Yager maybe on the first line because Furlan's been struggling lately or you can just change things up all over the place like it, it just it gives you that additional option where that option wasn't there before so, Matt, I mean, looking at that with Hathaway, we see that we probably have Versteeg out long-term. Would you keep Hathaway up here? Do you think that you keep Hathaway on the team until Versteeg comes back? Yeah, well, for sure. Uh, he's played better than everybody else that's vying in those depth roles. So, yeah, he's he for me, he's won the spot. As long as he continues to play well, obviously. Like, if his play diminishes, then obviously somebody else will take his spot. But he's done everything that the coaching staff's looked for. Uh, what more can you ask? You you have two games where they were won because of the play of Garnett Hathaway. You know, and you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about the type of player you bring up in what scenario. And, you know, I'd said to you that I think Mangiapane should come up, but you only bring him up if a top six guy was hurt, and I think Hathaway fit better on that fourth line. But I think we're seeing a different Garnet Hathaway this year. Last year, I looked at Hathaway as sort of the the agitator, the bruiser, the, you know, sort of muscle for this team. And when we've seen him come up this year, he's not in that role. And I think so often today, it's not like in the 80s or 90s or even the early 2000s where you drafted a guy to a role. I think now you're seeing more and more teams drafting or signing or recruiting good players and then saying to the player, you have to be able to adapt to whatever role you're asked to play. And I think Garnet Hathaway is a great example of that. No matter what role we've asked him to play, he's been able to step into that, whether it's playmaker, whether it's, you know, crash and bang winger. We're yeah. seeing him play a whole bunch of different roles, and I think that makes him much more useful to the organization. Yeah, well... It always helps to acquire players, either through the draft or free agency, that are smart players on the ice and know what they have to do on the ice to be successful. And, like, you could never accuse Hathaway of being the next Johnny Gaudreau. But, but nor he, does he, he have to be. No, it's not a position to be put in. No, but he knows where he has to be on the ice 
to facilitate successful things happening for both himself and his line mates. And you see him repeatedly going right into the front of the net so that way he can either get rebounds or screen the goaltender or just generally be a, a thorn in the side. And because of that, you have the flexibility of with him to almost utilize him like the Flames have used Troy Brower on the power play where you can just stick him in front of the net and hope that he does, you know, a good job of screening the goaltender and all that. And even though you you look intrinsically in terms of raw talent, there are better options organizationally like Manjapani, but for overall fit, he has the brain to help get all of the other parts of his game to work at their peak efficiency. And you're seeing that where he's able to generate offense because like you see on the Kachuk game, uh, the tying goal where he was looking around and saw the lane to Kachuk and fired the pass over to him. It's one of those things where smart players will find a way to be successful and that's what you're seeing in his game a big thing with Garnet Hathaway I think people forget too is his age I mean we talk a lot about Japan. he's 21 he's still a very young hockey player if you look Sam Bennett is still 21 Lazar is 22 you know like Sean Monahan is 23 um, that's still, you know, very much a young guy. And most people say a hockey player doesn't peak till about 27 to 28. And if you look at Garden Hathaway, he's 26. So he's got a lot more time where he's been playing at different levels and had more pro looks. But I think that, to me, is a big reason why Garden Hathaway is looking better because he's, he's had more time playing a high-level game. Yeah, that too. You know, if we look at Mangiapane now versus where Mangiapane will be in five years, I bet it'll be a very different player as well. True. So I think, you know, if you look at Garn Hathaway, he's making 650000 this year. It's a one-year deal. As a 26-year-old, I really think this is also the year, and we said this about Watherspoon last year too, I think this is the year you either have to make a spot in the lineup or move on. I can't see the Flames bringing back a 27-year-old for an AHL role. No. Uh, I think if Garnet doesn't make the team, you know, if he doesn't have a good showing this call up and, you know, I think this is his call up to really earn a spot with Versteeg out long term. I think, you know, his time as a flame might be short. Everyone's got a Garnet Hathaway and, you know, I just don't see the flames bringing him back if he's not going to be in the NHL next year. No. And like Riddick, you need to play him to see what you have. And he to this point is showing that he is a quality depth player whether that continues into next season or beyond it you know you see Josh Juris having that great season when he first came in the NHL and I think he's played for five teams since then and there's there's not enough there there and you so, know sometimes guys just look better because of who they're playing with too and I think that's part of what we're seeing with Hathaway I think he looks good because he and Janko have chemistry and I think that might be the thing that keeps him around as long as you play him with Janko he looks good if he's not he might be end up being the next Freddie Hamilton who just sits in the press box and that very well could be too which is a fine role for him as well oh yeah you all you can't have all all all-star players you need to have good depth as well and especially once you get longer into the season where injuries do start to occur you need to have quality guys that can step in at a moment's notice and play an effective game yeah for sure you need you definitely need to have those guys you also need to have the guys that are cheap and available and who are always ready and it seems to me like with Hathaway the big thing that I like about him is no matter how often he plays he always seems like he's ready to go and I think as a 13th forward that's a really important trait as well Talking about another sort of bruiser on this team, last year we saw Hathaway play that role and that agitation role, and I think the other guy that's really grown into that is Matthew Kachuk. Kachuk has been doing some stuff this year that maybe shouldn't be, and we all saw the, uh, what was it, the spear from the bench? Yeah, on Witkowski for Detroit. 
Yeah. Which I didn't even I didn't even or, see. No, I'm still trying yeah. to get a good replay of that. Oh yeah, I mean the Toronto game. Yeah, I can't remember. It was uh, against Matt Martin, and yeah, and it did just you looked see like the... a a jab, like a light jab. But yeah, you're not supposed to do that. And did you see the uh, the next day when he had to apologize and he had Trill living next to him and. I don't know how much of it was acting, but, you know, he's standing there. He's got his eyes looking down. He looks like a little kid that was so guilty. And I just, I thought it was a great apology. I think it's one of those things where the Flames are probably saying be, behind closed doors, keep doing what you do. But in public, it's, oh, we don't want him doing this anymore. It's always a fine line. And, you know, like it, when you're familiar with a couple of, players like Keith Kachuk and Chris Chelios they played the game a very certain type of way and they were very successful doing it that way and so when those are your teachers <laughs> it you kind of can't change that it it is who he is and you just kind of have to guide him into do it while you're on the ice and don't interfere with anybody off the ice but do whatever you want to do on the ice you know you want to get <laughs> everybody pissed off at you go right ahead just keep it on the ice surface and chris johnston one of the senior writers for sportsnet has said he's reported that ray whitney of uh, the department of player safety with the nhl is actually expected to meet with kachuk to explain the problems and once he f and show him kind of what is going on, what they want and what they don't want. Show him clips that are good of him, show him clips that are bad of him. And when I heard that, I'm thinking, you know what? This seems like an overreaction, but at the same time, I can see the league saying, we know his pedigree, he's a young man, let's try to nip this in the bud. Yeah, well, they don't want... You look at Kachuk, and he's a very good, dynamic, offensive player. And he can be a 60, 70-point guy. And a very marketable star potential player. So they don't want him to get in his own way to sabotage his own career and go down a path where, like, how would you say, if he does something wrong, he might get in a situation where he gets hurt as well. Because, you know, sometimes the other player will overreact and, you know, it causes problems. So... It's one of those things where he needs to pick his spots a little better. Like, you, you can be a dick on the ice and get in under the other team's skin. Lots of players, including his father, were absolutely perfect at it. But you don't want to see him get hurt or injure somebody else because of crossing that line. It's one of those things where he'll learn... You know, it is an overreaction by the league. I think both suspensions were a little bit ridiculous. And if it was anybody else, I'm not sure that either suspension would have happened. But it is what it is. And hopefully he can learn the exacting parameters so that way he knows where the boundaries are and then push his game right to that edge <laughs> i think in some ways is the league trying to draw a line in the sand as well to say you know what if we let kachuk get away with this then every rookie who comes in and wants to play the same way or gets called up from the farm trying to make a name for themselves they're not going to know where the line is so i think just based on what's happened it's convenient for the league to say we're going to make an example of kachuk yeah and yeah, I do hope at some point that the Flames can acquire a high first-round draft pick to get his brother, because, boy, that'd be fun. But, you know. <laughs> you got to look at the cost, though. Yeah, it'd be fun, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you said it. As long as he's not in the Pacific Division, we're okay. Yeah. But, uh, no, he's always good at dra drawing penalties and all of that and he gets under the other team's skin and frankly the flames need to do more of that i think they're a little still a little too gentlemanly in their approach which well i think is that's fine, a big reason but... why kachuk is so popular here i mean we've always in calgary liked the what i called the daryl sutter guys or now i guess we'd call the brian burke guys those truculent what we used to call the western canadian players 
right? Those sort of sandpapery players. And if you look through Flames history, the most popular Flames have usually been the Bruisers. You know, your Tim Hunters, your Sandy McCarthy's, your your guys who aren't Rocky Thompson, guys who aren't afraid to mix it up. And I think that Kachuk's the best of both. He's not afraid to mix it up. He's not afraid to get on their people's skin. But at the same time, he's a good offensive force. And I think he's also got to be careful because if you get too many people angry at you, you're bound to get hurt. And that's kind of what I'm waiting for is how long until somebody takes a cheap shot at him and hurts him. And I think that might be one of the reasons the league wants to step in early as well. Yeah. And that's what I'm worried about too. You know, someone you just need cross to the back of the shoulders or, you know, hit to the head. And I can just see his career being ended prematurely because he's, he's barked up the wrong tree. Exactly. And I could see some team, some player on some team doing that just because, they get a little too peed off at him, and, you know, he does a good job of it. So I can understand why the league wants to, especially because he's such a good player outside of that. Like, he's already a top defensive player and a good offensive player, and he's not 20 yet. So, you know, just hopefully he can learn that line so that way... He doesn't get into too much trouble. The other thing I find interesting about him, and I mean, I've been spending a lot of time with the players in the dressing room talking to the players and stuff, but compared to a lot of the Flames' young players, he is such a better mic presence. Like, he does better interviews than most of our young players. And I think part of that's probably learning from his dad and being around the NHL for so much of his youth. But, I mean, you know, the the boring Sean Monaghan meme has been out there for a while and we know that Monaghan he's getting better at interviews for sure but he's not the best and I think that Kachuk for a player of his age is just so much better already on that microphone well that's exactly it like that's why I think the NHL wants him to knock it off a bit with the antics because of the fact that he is a very marketable person because he is a very gregarious personality and you want that from players and that's why like get him to play the right way so that way he's not gonna you know because the NHL also has to look at selling a product and he's a very good spokesman for that so you don't want players like that getting hurt needlessly or suspended all the time (laughs) I think it's going to become more of, I think he'll be a bigger face of the Calgary Flames every year. And I can see eventually this guy having a letter on him. I just think that he's going to be more of that media face. And it might make some of the guys like Monaghan, like, um, you know, Goudreau, who aren't as good at that or maybe don't like it as much, be able to step back a little bit and have that almost like Jerome was. I know he was the captain, but he was just a good media face. The media always talked to him, and I can see Kachuk being the next guy in that role. I agree. Well, Matt, with everything we've talked about at this point, as of right now, which is December 11th as we record this, the Calgary Flames are back in a wild card spot. They said 34 points, which means we're one point back from San Jose and the third spot in the Pacific Division and one point up on both Minnesota, Dallas, and Chicago. So based on where we're sitting this week, um, do you think still the sky's falling? Do you think it's kind of a week-by-week thing, or do you think this team has drastically improved over the last week? Well, I am still in the let's wait and see mode because they had three good games, and... You know, if they have another good handful of games between now and Christmas, that helps to solidify the... six games left till Christmas. Yeah, so, like, if they have a good five, six games between now and Christmas, like, they don't have to win them all, but play well. And not... Well, like the Toronto game, right? We didn't walk away with the two points, but we definitely showed that we were the better team. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, we lost, but the team looked good. And as long as they're doing the right things, even if they come out on the losing end, you can still walk away saying, well, you ran into a hot goalie, it happens. It's not you lost to Edmonton and Philadelphia, (laughs) you know. So it's still a work in progress and waiting and seeing, but 
you know, it's an encouraging step forward. The next game's against Minnesota, who's behind us in the standings. Hopefully they get two points from that one. And they hopefully they get a little bit on a roll and can start pushing themselves more up into the top five zone instead of being down near the bottom. I think for me this last week, I wouldn't say it's a reset, but I think the Flames have definitely sort of, I wouldn't say start again, but I think they've broken their game down and they're trying to build it back up. I think in Toronto, we saw the Flames play a better game than they had before. I think Montreal and Vancouver, we saw a much simpler game. And especially the Vancouver game. I mean, a lot of people were saying on Twitter is boring, but I think the Flames were trying to break their game down to its foundation. And I think to me that's promising that obviously they're saying, hey, there's something we need to change here. It's not, oh yeah, we got lucky and got four points out of six. I'm starting to see some upward motion in the type of game they're playing. Yeah, and it's one of that was what I was criticizing in the last show was that there were certain things that were happening throughout the lineup and how everything was working that there was just minor structural problems that was the team was getting in their own way because of those problems. And now it seems like they're making slight adjustments to, because there was nothing that was drastically wrong. It's not like they were giving up breakaways left, right, and center or something where, like, okay, tighten up on the defense right now. It was a lot more subtle than that. But now they're making those fine adjustments, and hopefully that tweaking can get them on that right page and where they are genuinely successful for most of the games. And, like, there will still be stinker games where they give up, like, six goals to some random team. But as long as that's like a one-off event and they respond properly when those happen and are consistently good otherwise, then, you know, it'll, they'll be moving in the right direction. And frankly, right now, they're nine points out of first place, and that's not a insurmountable hill to climb especially because we've only played the kings once i do believe this season and i think we play them three times next month so it is possible to get back up into that stratosphere it's just they got to get everything on a roll and even the coaching staff today was talking about the power play needing some tweaks to it and hopefully that starts to be successful with what modifications that they make so here's kind of a, a kind of weird idea, but I had this idea this morning. Sometimes I think injuries can be a good for a team. You never want to see a guy go down, but I think with Yager out and with Versteeg out, I really think it's made the coaching staff have to take a different look at their lineup. And I think that with those two guys out, we're seeing, I mean, you mentioned Brower's looking better. Brower's getting a different look. Brower's getting some more minutes. I think that with two guys out of lineup, it's really making the coaches look at this team differently and potentially use their lineup and use their players in a different way. And I think right now, maybe that's all the Flames need is just try some guys out in different roles or let somebody step up into, say, that power play role. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where there is too much talent on this team for the team to be where they were. So it sometimes just making those slight modifications is enough. Sometimes you need to like either demote or promote people. It just depends. And we'll see in the next game... Uh, Yager's not going to be playing against Minnesota, so we'll see Hathaway again. And if he has another strong performance, then okay, what do we do with Yager? Do we throw him on the first line with Gaudreau and Monaghan? Do we throw like the 3M line out of whack by throwing Yager on that line? You know, there's plenty of different ways of doing things to shake things up, and it, we'll see, and especially when Yager gets back to see how things shake out and hopefully the team can be enriched by the modifications and move forward. So just talking about Yager for a minute. I mean, this is the second time we've seen him out with an undisclosed lower body injury this season already. I think we, I think a lot of us overestimated what we we're going to get out of Yager. I mean, it's fun to have him here, 
but he's 45. He's definitely looking slow. I don't think he's at a point where he's a first-line right winger for this team. Do you think that we may see if a guy like Hathaway is playing well, Yager sort of becomes that 13th forward for this team where you slot him in when you've got space? No, I I think Yager, well, he has a dynamic to him that he can slot in basically any offensive line and be good. It, and yeah, he's not quick, but frankly, the Flames as a whole are not a fast team. So, like, they're quick, but they're not a bunch of blazers like, say, the Penguins are. So, it, it's one of those things that he becomes kind of a wild card where you can throw him in here, there, ev- everywhere, and you just have to manage his minutes to make sure that he's okay physically. And I think that, like, he got hurt in that bag skate the last week. And I think that the Flames need to manage him and his on-ice time, off-game time, better as well to make sure that he's healthy and able to go whenever. It's one I'm of almost things. wondering. I mean, we saw when he got put with Bennett and Janko, both those guys looked good. I almost wonder if you try him on a more veteran line, put him on the fourth line with Brower and Stajan and see what those three can do. That's a possibility too. And I think I, I would try him on a... Because of the fact that Furlan's struggling lately, I, I would try him on the first line. It's just so just, slow. Yeah, well, Monaghan's not quick either, so it's not that big a deal. But he's slower than Monaghan. I mean, he looks like a 45-year-old. Yeah, so uh, just because he's slow doesn't mean that he's bad. It, no, I'm it, not saying he's bad. I think those guys just need to adapt their play. I think they're used to, when they're going towards that net, Furlan's right there with them. And I think they have to realize if you do put Yager there, you might not have all three guys right by the net. You might have one guy to step behind you. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing. But I think it's just going to take some adaptation from Johnny and Money. Oh, yeah. And that's the key. Like it. One of the reasons why the Bennett line got going was that they modified their game into more of a cycle and pass the puck around style of game. And that fits very well with the Gaudreau line. So it's one of those things where if you threw Yager on any of the four lines, I think it would be a perfectly fine thing. It's just having to find what works best for him in terms of ice time and what all the other players are doing, basically. Like, if, say, Michael Froelich struggled mightily for whatever reason on the second line, maybe you throw Yager on that line for a game or even a couple of shifts just to get a different look type of thing. There's lots of different ways you can go about it to see basically and i think, I think that- managing his minutes like you said is going to be important and that's why i i'm really thinking you see him sort of play fourth line minutes five on five and then he might step into the spot left five versus Stieg on the power play yeah i could see that i think that him being utilized on the power play is definitely like he should be on the first power play unit it's well, just it's managing everything about him a little bit more with kid gloves, so to speak. That's all. Yeah, I think we've, I think as Flames fans and as I think Flames management too, I think it's starting to sink in that he is an older guy. I think it's starting to sink in that maybe he's not as durable as we're used to with our players. And yeah, I think that there's a little bit more management with number 68 than there might be with anyone else in the roster. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. It's just you have to have a different set of rules with him. That's all, which that's not a big deal. So we we're talking about the power play earlier. I don't know if you read every week, Elliot Friedman's 31 thoughts column, but this week he said with Chris for out uh, for a long time, Calgary may look for a power play specialist and someone who brings edge to their game. They feel a little too nice Outside of Travis Hamanick, Michael Furlan, Mike Smith, and Matthew Kachuk. Those are the guys I guess they're saying there and have a little bit of nastiness to them. And then Friedman continues, I could see the Flames part of a growing group eyeing Buffalo's Evander Kane. End quote. 
you and I talked about our thoughts of Kane coming in a few weeks ago. Um, again, I think, you know, we definitely need to do something on the power play. You can definitely feel Versteeg's loss there, but I don't think that having to go out and acquire Kane, and as you and I have talked about, what do we give up? I just think that bringing in Evander Kane, the cost is going to be too high for the Flames. I think they can find that power play guy internally, be that Yager, be that somebody else. Well, that's the thing. Like, it, with any of the potential rental guys... Like, I wouldn't want to lose Oliver Shillington. I wouldn't want to lose Rasmus Anderson or Adam Fox or, or Yusuf Alamaki or any of the goaltender prospects. So, and like, that's basically all our good players that would be available in trade. I don't want to lose them because they're good. So, the biggest roster name I think you could move to Buffalo would be, if they wanted to, Michael Froelich. But yeah, you, you know, yeah, I, I think I could for, see that. Yeah, that like, would be I, a possibility. Yeah, I don't want to give up for a leak, but you and I have talked about how there's nobody I want to give up. As I've really looked at this roster, saying what do we want to give up? We want to give up Brower. We want to give up Stajan, but nobody wants those pieces. But when I look at what am I willing to part with versus what would somebody want? I think with three years left on his deal, for a leak is movable. I'm not saying you do move him, but I would not want to move him for a rental. You and I have different thoughts on Evander Kane. We've talked about this. I would be okay with Evander Kane being a flame, but I don't want to move for a league for a rental. I think if you're going to do that, you have to have talked to the agent and make sure you're going to get a long-term deal out of that. Yeah, and for a league's going to cost, or Kane is going to cost probably a first and a second. And we don't have uh, Or equivalent assets. And yeah, I think I it's for a league plus. Yeah, and you're probably looking at, say, for a leak, Rasmus Anderson and a third or something like that. Do you give that up? I personally don't. And no, even, not for uh, Vander Kane. No, and, like there are plenty of players out there that that price tag, sure, fine. It's just, I don't know what's available right now. Like There are some teams that are struggling, like, say, Ottawa and there's a couple of players on the Senators that I wouldn't mind, but it just depends on what the ask is. And well, I also think that if you look at Evander Kane, I personally think there's two guys who are going to command the biggest return to the deadline, Evander Kane and James Neal. Yeah, And I think sure. both, of, both those guys, I think the, the offers are going to be so heavy coming in. There's going to be so much competition for them that the Flames would – just get priced out of the market. I don't think we could put together a package that would be competitive with some of the crazy prices other teams would pay. I mean, we don't even have a first-round pick to move, and I think a team like Buffalo, they don't want veterans. They're looking for picks. Yeah, or high-end prospects, and I wouldn't want to say give up Valimaki for a, a rental. Like, that'd be nuts. So I'm not... Yeah, and, and I'm not saying this specific player, but I like the Curtis Lazard deal last year in that it brought in an asset nobody else was going for. I think the Flames were able to make a trade, so yeah. not for the biggest names that were out there, and I think we're seeing Lazard looking pretty good this year, but I think that's more what the Flames need to do. They need to find those guys that somebody wants to move that nobody else is going after and bring those kind of guys in. And I just I don't think that we have the assets to play for you know any of these big name guys where we're just going to get outbid. I can also see Edmonton in the running for Kane. Yeah, same here. Um, the main player that I'd like to see the Flames target that is an affordable option uh, would be John Gabriel Peugeot from the Ottawa Senators. He's a center and a right winger. Uh, he's 25, has 12 points in 28 games this year. He's more of a depth player, but he's quick. And he has a knack for scoring hat-tricks in the playoffs. He has two of them. Uh, but he seems to be more of that secondary depth guy who can chip in. And I think that's more of the target that the Flames need to be going towards because they already have the main players that they need like they already got Gaudreau Monaghan they already got Kachuk Backlund they already have Jankowski Bennett you don't need really to go and get another high-end top player you can nibble around the edges so to speak and get the secondary players that can fit around 
your already established players. And I think that a guy like Peugeot won't cost you very much in terms of assets. Uh, you could probably get him for like the equivalent of a third round pick. Well, and there's a lot of talk today that Pierre Dorian is trying to make a move. It's been said that he's been very active looking to do something. Yeah, and perhaps because of the fact the Flames have so many prospects. Like, Can we give him Lazard back? Well, I, I was even thinking guys like Poirier and Klimchuk and Shin Carrick could be available for a guy like Peugeot. And that would be perfectly acceptable to me. So, Would you move Hathaway? If somebody wanted him, do you think that we need Garnet Hathaway or would you use him as an asset? Honestly, I don't see other teams valuing Hathaway as being anything more than like your 13th, 14th But forward. I think he could be a throw-in piece to sweeten a deal. Possibly, but at this rate, I think he has more value in terms of being in the organization than what you'd get for him, if that makes sense. But I sense. mean, I think he's got more value than Klimchuk. Not really. you got to remember that teams value, oh, he was a four, former first-round pick more than what the player actually is. So I think that just the pedigree of, oh, he was the first, so therefore he has some talent overrides the, the fact that Hathaway is doing better right now. Maybe. I think it depends on the GM. True. Um, yeah, I can definitely see the Flames making a move. Another guy, and we haven't really talked about this, I, since I've been looking at the roster trying to figure out who could we move, I personally like him, but I can also see the Flames this season or next season. You know, you're not shopping him around, but I can see if you need a piece to move, trying to move TJ Brody. Again, yeah, I, I guess... Um... I mean, they that, just got that, a Hamannick. You're not going to flip him. Yeah, the the thing that I'm... It's tough just due to the fact that the Flames have so many good young up-and-coming defense prospects that the Flames will eventually have to move on from one or more of the current top four. It's just... It's so tough to move a guy like Brody unless you're getting... Like it, unless you're basically getting like the same exact trade as the Seth Jones deal, where you're getting a top line forward that's the same age as Brody, I wouldn't bother. See, and, I don't think I'm not. I know there's a lot of fans now that are saying, "Oh, we should cut bait on Brody now while he's still worth value." I don't think that, but I guess I agree with you that yeah, eventually we need to move one of our top four, and I think that Brody. Of those top four, I mean, even looking at the contract is probably the one to move. You're not going to move Hamilton. You'd keep Hamannick if nothing else is he's cheaper. But I can see of those top four if we're going to move somebody moving Brody. Yeah, uh, and... You could also recover a bunch of picks for him as well. Yeah, it's one of those things that there's not really any onus to do so right at this point with any no, of the... No, I, I, I don't know, think like you're I, trying to move him now. You know, but just like looking you, at you, saleable assets is what I guess I'm oh, looking for at. Sure. I think that Froelich and Brody are really the two saleable assets on the NHL roster that this team has. Yeah, I could see that. It's just... We're not for moving me, there's, Goudreau. We're not moving yeah, Monaghan. Nobody like that, wants Brower. Yeah, like there's just no need right now to get like move any of the four. Especially... Because uh, both Shillington and Anderson, uh, they don't have to clear waivers next year. That And you have Valimaki and Fox just doing their thing in juniors and the NCAA. That until those guys are forcing their way into the team, that you need to really concern yourself with moving players out. And it's one of those things where because defensemen are so highly valued that I just leave those guys alone and like for until like next draft like not this year's but like the following one before looking at any potential moving of any of the defensemen that are currently on the team just yeah, because no, of, I'm, I'm not know, saying it, it's one of those them, yeah it's one of those things where like if somebody offered a legitimate top line forward for one of the four defensemen you'd have to look at it because 
like uh, you wouldn't be doing your due diligence otherwise but well, if you it, look at you the would salary, have to be you'd have to be blown away by it, especially because all four of the defensemen really are affordable contracts and you don't want to like you're going to have to pay whomever you get likely more than what you're paying the defensemen. So you also have to factor cap management into it as well and you have four guys that are top-notch defensemen for very little money comparatively so it's doable it just it needs to be the exact right trade and i don't it, those are hard to come by and i think the big thing there is how well brett kulak does i mean i think we're seeing more out of kulak than we thought we would and i think that if kulak if the organization thinks kulak can be a top four guy or stone can be a top four guy you might see that move happen at the draft or next year that's a feasibility. It also depends on what Shillington and Anderson do. Like if they well, look it, like they're ready for top four duty as well, then that gives you ad added flexibility. But you don't want to get into a situation where, oh, good, we now have three NHL defensemen again. And no, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you go and pull these triggers, but I'm just looking at saleable assets. Oh, for sure. Um, but, and you were mentioning next year the dead, at the draft. I mean, you know, both Brody's contract and Frelick's contract are up in 2019-2020, and I can see both guys, if they do hold on to them that long, being, you know, good assets for um, a rental for somebody. But... Looking at the salary of our top four defensemen, Giordano's making 6.7, Hamilton's making 5.75, uh, Brody's making 4.6, ha Hamannick's making 3.8, and then Stone is making 3.5. I don't think you can afford to keep those five all back on renewal. So I think if nothing else, Brody, Hamannick, and Stone all expire in 2019, 2020. I think you're going to have to move one, if not two of those contracts by then. I just, I don't think you can afford to re-sign re all three of them. By the time we look at, like you oh, were saying, no. guys that might and be coming that's up the and thing, what they're like, going to deserve. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like right now for this season and next, there's not really any expiring contracts that are going to be very costly. Like Backlund is basically, if you give him Stajan's contract on top of what he's currently making, you're good. So like there's not really any need right now to do any cost cutting measures so i'd almost kind of shelve that whole discussion for that you know after the that though then you're gonna have to look at do you buy out brower's final year do you trade for a leak do you trade one of like say giordano or whatever but that's a another topic for a show like 20 episodes from now 30 and a episodes couple of years now. yeah <laughs> or as we get close to the deadline yeah well match we answer some fan questions definitely we had a couple people reach out to us this week and ask us some questions the first one is with all the talk of uh seattle and possibly houston and relocation and expansion what do we think about the seattle arena deal and how it affects the flames i'll start with this one i don't see the NHL relocating to Seattle. When you've got $650 million expansion fee available, they're going to want to expand. You'd be stupid to leave that money on the table. I think you don't have to worry about the Flames moving to Seattle. That team is going to be the 32nd team. It just makes sense. It balances everything out. So moving to Seattle, no. I have heard some people say that maybe the Flames will move to Houston. Murray Edwards said at the Board of Governors meeting, this team's not for sale. And Matt, you and I talked about this before the show. I think that Calgary's a big enough hockey market. If Murray wants to sell the team, someone else will buy it and leave it here. And if worst comes to worst, let's say the Calgary Flames move to Houston, somebody else within two, three years will buy, say, Arizona and move back here. Like, I just can't see an NHL without Calgary having a team. Well, the Flames are one of the top 10 or so markets in the NHL. So it, it, you would be stupid to, oh, I'm going to take this you know top market team and take it to somewhere where there's no fan base not just in the nhl we're one of the few cities that can sell them both nhl and whl hockey yeah and like you have to figure that both seattle and houston are going to be lower than average market teams 
at least for the first couple of years that they're in existence just because of the nature of usually those teams are like if it's a relocation or an expansion usually those teams are terrible Vegas yeah, seems the teams to be that an are exception. Relocating are the crappy teams, right? So you're not getting a good team. Yeah, like you look at, say, like Arizona relocates to Houston. Well, yeah, have fun with that. Well, They're I mean, the not last gonna... example was Atlanta, right? They were a terrible team. They moved to Winnipeg. Winnipeg turned it around quickly, but it was still yeah. A terrible well, team yeah, Winnipeg. and that you know, I do have to credit Winnipeg for their excellent drafting, and that's how they managed to dig themselves out of it. And... Shevel Dayoff's done a good job. Yeah, it, his, he built his team through the draft, and that's how they've turned into a top-tier team. And that's one of those things where, like, it, it just it doesn't make any financial sense for the league in terms of revenue or logic, basically, for the Flames to relocate. Because, like, yeah, the Flames need a new arena, but even if the Flames stay in the Saddle Dome and they're not maximizing revenue, they will still generate more income than more than half of the league. So it, it, it's like, gee, let's sell our Lexus or, you know, BMW to go get a Kia car. It, it's like, yeah, but why? <laughs> and you could do that. The Flames have drawn their line in the sand, or at least the current Flames ownership have drawn their line in the sand about the arena deal. I don't think this is dead. I mean, I think if if Murray Edwards doesn't want to play with Nenshi, I think a new ownership group might be willing to relook at it. And you know, I oh, think yeah. that the, I think and that I don't think the options that are on the table right now are necessarily the best option. But I think if you've got two groups that seriously want to sit together and hammer this out, it's got to be Victoria Park at this point. It's just a matter of coming up with the right deal. And I think a new ownership group would be more than happy to sit down, hammer that out, and keep this team here. Yeah, and realistically, like, no team's going to get the sweetheart deal that Edmonton did. And, and yeah. I think Seattle's arena deal is a great... I know that Ken King kept quoting Edmonton's deal as the one that he wanted and the one he was using as a model. And I really think now Seattle's deal should be the model for Calgary. Yeah, and like the the city's offer was fair. It, it Like it, it was more realistic than the Flames' offer option was and there you have to negotiate to get a middle ground you can't just walk into a negotiation and say i want everything and i get my way or the highway like it you know it that's just not how things work in the real world so you know when the flames and the city get down to being realistic and trying to find a middle ground then things will get done. Until then, you know, it is what it is, and both sides are stamping their feet and not get it going anywhere. But to answer this guy's question, I think, yes, we see a Seattle team. I think yeah. we'll see Seattle. Oh, I, I see Seattle and Houston both getting organizations. Seattle, I think Seattle expands Houston's relocation. Yeah, and I'd expect that Arizona would get moved to Houston just so that way you can keep the time zones approximately the same so keep that the way. time zones the same and also keep the conference balance then the same yeah exactly and the, i i would big see question to me then is what happens in quebec city i thought that would carolina. be carolina yeah but they now have a seven year the new sale they have a seven year deal that they have to stay in carolina yeah well that can be broken so we'll see like uh, there's lots of different options like because the group that bought uh the hurricanes is from dallas it's possible that you see arizona go to quebec city and carolina go to houston that's a possibility we'll see there there's plenty of options i just don't the, see any of them involving calgary no and, and you know again like i said do you if worse comes to worst and and Murray Edwards sells this team to outside ownership. I think very quickly another team will come here. This city's always had good hockey. I mean, you know, look way back at the Cowboys. There's always been some sort of professional hockey in this town. And I just, I think that you'd be yeah. foolish to pull out of a cash cow. I mean, it makes sense to pull out of Arizona, but somebody, there's also a lot of deep pockets in this city and there's a lot of support for this hockey team. I wouldn't say there's a sports town, but there's definitely a hockey town. And I think whether it's, 
all Calgary owners or a primary Calgary owner and a bunch of sub owners, sort of like when the Hitman came in, it was Bret Hart and a bunch of other guys like Sackick and stuff. I think there's enough money in and around this town that you keep the flames here. No question. Yeah. Same here. The next fan question we have comes from another Matt, not the Matt I'm on the line with, but another Matt. Uh, he goes by at flames underscore nation 74 on Twitter. And he asks us, what do you do with the Janko line after Yager comes back? Do you keep Hathaway on the right side or put Yager there again? Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. We talked a little bit about this earlier, what do you think, Matt? You're you're saying you'd probably keep Hathaway there and move Yager to line one? If Hathaway has a good game tomorrow against Minnesota, because he, he's played well there since he's been put on that line, I'd almost leave that one alone. And because of the fact that Furland's struggling right now, I'd put Yager on the first line and just see how that goes and then play everything by ear and so where do you put furley then on the fourth line with, with Brower stage and Brower? And, yeah exactly and just Poor play furley. it by ear and see how it goes I, i'd actually have lazar on that line as well as furlan but anyhow uh just see how things go and go from there and like if hathaway struggles or yager struggles or furlan struggles or you you just don't know until you get there. So I would leave it as is right now and then see how things go. Because, like, if Hathaway starts playing poorly, then you probably demote him and put Yager back on that spot. So we'll see. It, it, everything, it just depends. But with you having several players playing well, it gives you options to at least to move things around. So... We'll see. What's, what's exciting to me is what you just said. We have options. I think you could have a third line that is, say, Bennett, um, Jankowski, and Hathaway, and a fourth line that is, say, Furlan, Lazar, and Yager, and Sid, both Brower and Stajan. That's possible. So we'll make this our poll of the week. Let's get everyone else's feedback. I personally think that you put Yager back in that line and you move Hathaway to the fourth line. Um, I would also try, I think, maybe putting Lazar on line one, but lots of options there. So we'll we'll put this out to you guys. If you guys want to vote on this, the question for the week is, what would you do with the Jankowski-Bennett line when Yager returns? And the a options we'll put out there are put Yager back on the line, keep Hathaway there and find another spot for Yager, demote Furland to find someone else for the first line. Maybe you think they should try, try Troy Brower there since he's starting to get hot. Uh, Curtis Lazar is the answer, or the last option we'll put in is promote Andrew Mangiapani. And as always, you can vote on that by going to firesidechat.ca. We'll have the poll on the homepage. You can vote on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash firesidechat or Twitter where we're at Fireside Podcast. So I think this will be an interesting one to figure out what people say. Matt, if you remember last week, our question was, what do you do to get the Flames out of their funk? And most of our fans agreed with you. 42% of respondents also thought it's time to move on from Glenn Gullitson. Yeah, well, it, if the Flames continue to play well, then there's no problem. But if things start sliding back to where they were, then something has to change. So we'll see. It, it's one of those things we don't have enough information. We'll see. And this is a pretty tight poll, though. 42% said fire the coach. 36% said stay the course. It's too early in the season to do anything dramatic. Yeah, and uh, that's understandable as well. That's kind of what um, I was saying last week, too. Is, you know what? Let the coach make some tweaks and you know keep them here and see what they can do. And I still think, as I said last week, the Flames might have a better season than they should just because of the Pacific Division. Mm -hmm. um, I'm... Every week, and we talk about this every week, I'm still still worried about Vegas. Well, yeah, they'll fall soon. Flurry's back, so, you know. We've been saying that, that for how many weeks now? Yeah, well, Flurry's back, so now they're going to suck. Can they get worse than Edmonton? No, nobody's worse than Edmonton. Can they? Well, Arizona. Yeah, well, <laughs> even Arizona's not worse than Edmonton. <laughs> Points-wise, they are. The, yeah, well, I'm not talking about points. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Edmonton should relocate. 
Yeah. They bring shame to, to the, their city. To, to the AHL, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> well, isn't it like professional soccer where you can actually get demoted to the league below you? Yeah, that's exactly it. Relegate so, them to the AHL. I'd be curious, if the Edmonton Oilers scrimmaged their AHL team, which team would win? Honestly, if you took McDavid out of the team, I think that the AHL team would win. And I'm not. I'm not actually being funny. I'm actually serious. Uh, that team is just so bad. I, I. It is so hard to explain how. Like you're given basically the top player in the NHL, and you're still a pile of crap. But that's what that's is why wrong you're with the you? Top player. Like, you know, you could get somebody who's not a hockey fan, and could do a better job at building a team than what the Edmonton Oilers have done. Do you think maybe it, they'd be better to fire their coach and have an Xbox simulate the season for them? Honestly, if they, they took the people on HF boards and got them to do... We have this plan, this trade offer, yay or nay, and got a fan poll, I think that would honestly be better than what the organization has been doing for the last 10 years artificial intelligence is the hot thing right now you remember that computer that played jeopardy that thing could probably run the oilers uh and probably do a better job but yeah it, i i'm at a loss for words that like the owner hasn't literally fired everybody because i would have fired everybody a long time ago and you know like you just can't keep being this bad like because here's a crazy thought that I just had we saw Gretzky rejoin management this year how long until Gretzky becomes GM sometime soon I'm sure he'll he may be the coach and the GM I wouldn't be shocked I wouldn't put him back behind the bench yeah he wasn't as bad of a coach as you know yeah he pretty much was but anyhow <laughs> you could put Messier behind the bench and Gretzky in the office yeah, that, they like to hire their own. Yeah, it's uh, it's something special up there. Yeah, it, I am at a loss for words for Edmonton, but yeah, it is what it is. All right, so who do you who do you think would win in this matchup? The now first place in the Pacific Division, Stockton Heat, or the Edmonton Oilers without McDavid? Easily the Heat. I think that honestly, I'm not sure that the Oilers could beat half of the AHL teams. I'm trying to even name a player in the Oilers system. Like, it seems like everybody they've drafted that's worth anything is in the NHL. Well, that's the uh, main problem like, with the Oilers versus, the farm as a goalie? like, uh, the Oilers versus, like, every other team that's been bad is that while they have been getting help from their first-round draft picks, like, say, Calgary with Monaghan and Kachuk and Bennett, you're getting players from rounds two through seven and the Oilers just they might as well just trade the picks because they don't get anybody ever from any of their depth picks like I, I've never seen a team draft as badly like well, they could literally talked... throw darts at the dartboard and they'd have better success than what the Oilers have had well and I've mentioned this to you before I think if I were the Oilers a few times now I would have traded my pick moved down to get a defenseman like they don't, they can only ice four centermen on on a lineup. So at what point do you say, hey, we don't need any more of these guys? Let's trade down, get another asset, and get a defenseman. Well, or get a I am just hoping that they do not win the draft lottery and get get and then pr following ruin Rasmus Dolan. You know, because that's not fair to him. At what point a does the league so. put in an Oilers rule where you can only win the lottery so many times? Well, honestly, if the Oilers do, I think you'll see that. Maybe so. they rigged the draft. Yeah. The draft lottery. Yes. That wasn't the Oilers ball that came up. No, it was not. It was another one. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they say they do it live, but you could easily have a ball with, you know, two two logos on it, and you just reveal the side you want to show up. So one well, side is Oilers. It's, yeah, it's numbers, though. So, you know, it, they draft by numbers. You and can present it however you want to present it. Yes. True. So. Well, Matt, let's uh, not bash on the Oilers right now. we got a lot of Flames hockey to talk about. I think that's enough Oiler bashing for this week. we got to save some for later in the season. 
There's always time for Oilers bashing. Come on. We're Calgary Flames fans. There's always time for two things, Jello and Oilers bashing. Yes, exactly. I you wonder can if never you can get, get Jell-O and Oilers orange. Yeah, you could. <laughs> if anybody has an Oilers cookie cutter, let us know. I'd love to see that and cut out Jello shapes out of it. Yeah. Um, we got four games coming up, Matt, this week. Two on the road and two at home. Tomorrow night, the Flames are on the road to the Minnesota Wild, playing against them. The Wild are right below us in the standings. Then on Thursday, the 14th, the Flames play the team right above them in the standings, the San Jose Sharks at home at the Dome. On Saturday night, the 16th, the Flames play the Nashville Predators. And then coming uh, the next night on Sunday, they go on a short road trip to Vancouver where it's a 6 p.m. start time against the Canucks. So four points on the road, two home games, two road games. What do you think for the week? They really need six points this week. And in order – because all four of the games are against teams that they're vying with – for they have to spots. be Minnesota and San Jose because one's right below them, one's right above them. If they can take those four points, they could leapfrog quite a bit. Yeah. It, ideal situation is they sweep the week. That would be awesome. Uh, just to Based on how mess we're playing, everything, we're the week, you know, friend. like get leapfrog a bunch of teams and get up into <laughs> Vegas and LA's face a bit. But yeah, they need six at least. So hopefully that's the case. Whether... I think there's only one time this season we've won four in a row, and that was uh, early November when we won Calgary, New Jersey. Oh, no, then we lost to Vancouver. So, yeah, I don't, we haven't done four in a row yet. Yeah. Though well, at some point in the season we have to go on a big win streak, and knowing this team we're also going on a big losing streak, and that I think could be the downside. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, so you th- – you think six points. They, yeah, I'll go six, six points. Which yeah. one do you think they lose? I'll go with tomorrow night's game against that Minnesota. Against Minnesota? Yeah. I'm going to say that the Flames win Minnesota, win San Jose. I'll go six as well. I think they'll win Nashville. I think they'll lose Vancouver with Riddick and Nett. Uh, I works. think Vancouver has enough scoring talent that – they can give Riddick a hard time. Uh, I think even, even the Twins, even though they're not looking good, they can still give Riddick a hard time. Okay. So some weird start times for this week, just so everyone remembers. The Minnesota game is a 6 p.m. start time. San Jose is our regular 7 o'clock start time. Nashville is a late game because it's hockey night in Canada. That's an 8 p.m. Saturday night start time. And then the following day in Vancouver is a 6 p.m. start time. So four of the six games left before Christmas are this week. And... They let's just say, Matt. Fair to say, they have to win two. Oh yeah. They'd if like they three. if they lo- win only one game this week, then I don't think the coach will be here. But it, at the same time, we're now within Brian Burke's. We don't fire people window. Yeah. True. I think this. I think at this point, no matter what happens, he's here till January because we know that Brian Burke. I mean, the league imposes a trade freeze, and I think the league trade freeze starts on the 18th. But Brian Burke has a rule. You don't trade people. You don't fire people. I think it's generally from about the 10th onwards. Yeah. Oh, we'll see. It's one of those things where the team needs to just keep playing good hockey and they'll be successful. So I think we can definitely see four good Flames games. I just don't think we see four Flames wins. Yeah. We'll see. Well, let's see how they look, and we will talk next week before uh, the last two home games for Christmas, which is when they take on St. Louis and finish the Montreal series. So, Matt, you have a good week. Enjoy these games, and let's hope the Flames can get out of this one with at least six points of the eight. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.